Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Cinism and cinema so last time where we stopped we were talking about how postmodernist cinema happens to have certain features we talked about chinese box structure we talked about pastiche we talked about fragmented uh, editing techniques uh, we were referring to theories of linda hutchin especially with reference to her ideas on pastiche and we also talked about something called self referential cinema where cinema makes commentary on itself you remember so we talked about eight and half fellini's eight and half which is a commentary on the process of making a movie how many of you have watched eight and half are you familiar with that good wag the dog barry levinson's where uh, robert de niro and dustin hoffman play their lead roles and dustin hoffman happens to be a producer who stages a war in order to divert the american public's attention from the fact that the president is having an affair and the elections are round the corner so what do they do so there are certain spin doctors in the president's office headed by uh, robert de niro and they approach a film producer played by dustin hoffman and dustin is dustin hoffman is asked to give them a solution and he says if there is no war let's invent a war and that will distract the public and it does so it's a wonderful commentary on the role media plays in forging public opinion wet the dog i strongly recommend the movie robert de niro and hash dustin hoffman stardust memories purple rose of cairo both by woody allen and also zelig um and then you have edward and to die for we have already talked about these movies to die for is a movie starring nicole kidman who literally we were talking about dies for her 15 minutes of fame the movie was directed by gus von song um another important feature of postmodern uh, cinema is a hyperlink cinema we were the other way we were talking about hyperlink cinema we talked about babel remember and we also talked about uh, requiem for a dream so hyperlink cinema uh, is a term coined by elisa quart for films which are multilinear in a metaphorical sense and pulp fiction tops the list while talking about genre bending we were discussing the other day uh, how pulp fiction is a landmark movie in the way the narrative is constructed other examples of uh, hyperlink cinema could be adaptation sliding doors suriana you were already mentioning crash i would also like to add 21 grams and city of god i'm very sure most of these films are familiar to you of late we have been having uh, the phenomenon of anthology movies well this is nothing new it has always been in existence uh, a couple of directors coming together and making short films but it has become more fashionable in recent times so you have a number of big time filmmakers coming together and directing films coffee and cigarettes is an ex excellent example of uh, short movies uh, 10 minutes or so each movie run the running length of each movie would be 10 minutes or so uh, it's but all movies are directed by jim jamash hmm, who is an independent filmmaker also known by, for Uh, Johnny Depp is starring Dead Man. You must watch Dead Man, especially for its music. It has excellent rock music. Uh, Paris at the Time, that is Paris, I Love You, is an anthology of uh, movies by several directors. Okay, and all movies are centered on the city of Paris. And here, pa Paris is not just the glamorous city, okay, or uh, the way we use city uh, see Paris in. Uh, Uh, midnight in paris and woody allen's paris is not that kind of paris uh, you in this city you have racial tensions in this paris you have poverty you have alienation you have loneliness so 
it is that kind, but it is still Paris, I love you and directed by different directors, okay. different from coffee and cigarettes, because in coffee and cigarettes, which is the space, a restaurant, every all conversations are taking place in a restaurant over coffee and cigarettes literally, so therefore the title, Paris I love you, I love you Paris, in spite of all your weaknesses and faults, that is the idea. New York I love you, continuation, it is not as forceful as Paris I love you, but it's still it has a number of big time filmmakers directing films set in a short film set in New York, uh, Shekhar Kapoor is one of the directors. Uh, Tokyo stories and Toronto stories, Toronto stories is uh, completely set as uh, the title suggests in Toronto and Tokyo stories in Tokyo. So, why are, you know we call these films, we have another title for these kinds of films, do you know? Paris, New York, Toronto, Tokyo, City Symphony. Okay, so, these movies are also giving you a glimpse of city in its various manifestations. Hmm? So, uh, and very postmodern is because they give you fragmented glimpse, vignettes of something. Yeah? Coffee and cigarettes, so, a restaurant is not the focus, but the conversation, the kind of people you find. So, this is, you know, as uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald rightly points out in the great gets be the inexhaustible variety of human beings. This is what he is interested in, inexhaustible variety of human beings. So, in coffee and cigarettes, uh, the director is interested in the kind of people you find, all kinds of people around us, that is the idea. So, very postmodernist, very fragmented, because it is not a linear uh, traditional kind of a story. And they are not linked at all. They know absolutely no link between people in all these films. Any comments, Rehan? About to say the New York stories that you remember? Three movies I keep on referring to the New York Scorsese, Woody Allen, Coppola, all these children of New Hollywood's movement, and then uh, they come together. All these movies are set in the city of New York. So, wonderful movies, but not as short as you find in Pari, uh, Jatem and Coffee and Cigarettes. Each movie runs into some 40 to 45 minutes. Now, I am going to discuss, uh, now the key text for today's class is John Woo's Face Off. Anyone here who is not familiar with this very popular movie? I can see lot of smiles. How kind of you and how fortunate for me. Okay. So, John Woo directed this movie and uh, let me point your at, uh, attention towards the poster. Do you find anything uh, unique about the poster of this movie? This was the way the movie was released. Is it one face or two different faces? Two different faces, but how are they joined? How are they joined? Their e eyes become one, right? There are two, actually th these are fragments of two faces and they are joined together. Okay, and whose faces are these? Travolta and Cage. Yeah. And uh, one eye belongs to Nicholas Cage and one eye to John Travolta. But the faces are so joined that it almost looks, it is one face and having a common pair of eyes. Why do we need to have this kind of uh, poster for a movie like Face Off? And Face Off, we, we, if you have watched the movie, you know there is a literal meaning to it. Yeah, literally ripping somebody's face off. Hmm? But then, Avedanta, have you seen the movie? Oh, you must watch it. Okay, it is very postmodern, is therefore we are going to discuss it. But um, face slash off, uh, there is uh, another meaning to it. What is it? We often use the word Mexican face off. Hmm? Yeah, 
confrontation between two people. You know, that is a typical signature style in most Tarantino movies and most John Woo movies. People just pointing guns towards each other's come, you know, headlong confrontation. So, that is with and that is the basic theme of the movie. Nicholas Cage and John Travolta having a headlong confrontation and swapping identities, not by choice, but forced by circumstances. Yeah. And then how swapping faces and swapping identities lead uh, to the narrative, what kind of narrative emerges out of the swapping of it. So, it is a very good uh, uh, example of a postmodernist film, because we talk about fragmented identities, fractured narratives hmm? and all these features are present in face off. So, face off basically a very glossy, visually very compelling movie directed by the Hong Kong um, superstar director John Woo. Are you familiar with other movies by John Woo? The Killer? A Better Tomorrow, yeah, it is one of his uh, well known Chinese films, you know, Hong Kong martial arts movie. He is not a typical um, wired kind, action director kind of a, it is more like a psychological conflict also. So, face off has lot of psychological conflict. So, the movie talks about blurred identities and that is what you find in the poster also. And uh, um, uh, one key feature of the film is the way it represents masculinity uh, as the self-conscious acting out of gender roles. Um, John Woo happens to be a very hyper masculine kind of a director. All his films have a strong code of masculine conduct. Yesterday, we were talking about um, how Tarantino is uh, influenced by the cinema of Sam Peckinpah and Brian De Palma and those directors were known for their strong masculine codes and so is John Woo. Okay, so, if you watch the movie face off, you will understand uh, both these men have a peculiar code of conduct how to be a father, how to be a lover, how to be a husband, how to be a professional. Men on a mission, they have a personal code, they have a professional code, they have a, uh, they have certain ethics of behaving with certain people. So, those codes are important in all John Woo movies and come across very strongly in face off. So, um, the credit sequence itself, how uh, you have watched the movie recently Siddharth, how does it begin? I think the Nicholas Cage scene, right? It, mm, begins, it begins with the Nicholas Cage scene. You also have John Travolta playing a detective. yeah, a detective, an FBI cop, an agent, uh, who is out to get Nicholas Cage, who is a dreaded criminal. Hmm? Yes, and then there is a scene where uh, it's a merry-go-round scene where yes, where John Travolta's son is shot dead by Nicholas Cage. Of course, he meant to kill John Travolta, not the kid and after, subsequently John Travolta makes it a personal mission to catch Nicholas Cage. And uh, the merry-go-round scene evokes nostalgic memories of Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train, because that is the way Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. Uh, the, the climax of the movie is shot. Hmm? And that too is a movie about a face off between two men. That too hints at swapping identities, not literally face uh, swapping faces, but identities. Okay, strangers are, are on a train. If you watch these two movies back to back, you will understand that his, how important uh, Hitchcock's influence is on this movie thematically. So, there is an intertextual reference. Now, I quote Fred, Frederick Jameson here, where he sees the reliance on the styles of the past as an indication of the particular kind of nostalgia that is one of the defining characteristics of postmodern art. So, nostalgia happens to be a very important part of all postmodern art. 
okay. and this feature is seen very clearly in John Woo's face off. And um, Frederick Jameson also uses a term called random cannibalization of all the styles of the past, where uh, the past is reduced to a series of spectacles. So, Hitchcock's memorable scene is, um, if you quote or apply Frederick Jameson in John Woo's hands, it becomes like a random cannibalization, but now it is up to you to decide whether it is or whether he make, he, it, it, it is an integral part, it is an integral uh, intertextuality happening there. So, this is what Frederick Jameson says in postmodernism or the cultural logic of the late capitalism. I think I have been referring to this work quite often. This could be your, you know, one of your theoretical discussions. Uh, Jameson also says, and in this is another work, Postmodernism and Consumer Society, uh, where he talks about psychic fragmentation or schizophrenia of the postmodern life. Do take down these notes, uh, where he says, ex as experience of the isolated, disconnected, discontinuous material signifiers into uh, which fail to link into a coherent sequence. The schizophrenic does not know personal identity in our sense, a schizoid, a fragmented personality. Yeah. So, you, you, the person is not aware that there are two sides, very opposing, very contradictory sides to his own personality. Uh, do you know that face off was adapted, not exactly or not literally? But there was an adaptation in Hindi. Which movie was that? Are you aware of it? It was a very well known movie, much hyped. Did not do too well commercially, but for those times it was extremely well publicized, uh, much hyped movie called Ax. It was uh, the first movie directed by Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra starring Amitabh Bachchan and Manoj Bajpai, okay. where uh, they had given a touch of Indian uh, philosophy and spiritual element to the swapping, to the idea of swapping of identities. Now, see example of pastish in face off. So, uh, music is seen as a pastish, you know, it, it is a combination of several kinds of movies and now remember we were talking about high bro culture, low bro culture. So, you have uh, Handel's Hallelujah at one point, Nicholas Cage of all the people he personifies evil and he is in, uh, he is in a church, just almost making a spoof of a very holy song. Hmm? At the same time, you have plenty of rock music throughout the movie. And then you have another very uh, uh, memorable scene, which is a shootout scene. People are shooting all over the place. And then um, Nicholas Cage, he does not want his son to get exposed to that kind of violence. So, what does he do? No, no, he, he makes, out. yeah, he yeah, makes him wear a headphone yeah. and the song which is playing is somewhere over the rainbow, that is Judy Garland from Wizard of Oz. So, it is totally contradictory to whatever is happening outside, around the child. Child is, a, child watches the scene, bullets uh, going all over the place and people running and chasing each other, hitting each other, but he does not hear those sounds, because his father has put that uh, melodious, beautiful music on him. Okay, so, that is, and this is nothing new, this is a very common device, uh, having a background music, which is completely opposite to whatever is happening on screen. I can, how many of you are aware of Anurag Kashyap's uh, Bijay Nam Yaar that directed the movie Shaitan? I watched the movie. There is a scene where the, these youngsters, they are running all over the chawls of Dharavi and uh, they are clad in burqa, which make them uh, looks very, look very ridiculous. Yeah. And which is the song playing in the background? It is a shootout scene, police is chasing them. 
Koya Koya Chand remixed. Koya Koya Chand, which is originally a song, a very beautiful, melodious, something like somewhere over the rainbow kind of song, sung by Muhammad Rafi. Hmm? Uh, Devanand performed to that uh, song, uh, maybe during the 50s or the early 60s. But now having a song like that for a shootout scene, what does it? It's a very postmodernist device. Many a time we don't pay attention to these things. But if you look at it deeply, yes, the filmmaker has done lot of thinking about giving the right kind, the very appropriate kind of background music to the situation. Otherwise, what kind of background music would you expect in a shootout scene? The bang bang music, you know, or maybe very fast paced music. But Imagine somewhere over the rainbow or Khoya Khoya Chand, okay, for a scene which is extremely violent, hyperkinetic, but then you have a song like that as in the background. Okay, so, a very strong, uh, very forceful postmodernist device. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the idea of having a doppelganger or your other, your double is very intriguing. And this is another integral part of postmodern narratives, to have another identity and having a literal other. So, Sean Archer and Castor Pollux, Sean Archer is John Travolta, Castor Pollux is Nicholas Cage and both these men have a son each. Okay, so, uh, they are quite alike in the way they behave, in the way they uh, take their duties and their professions very seriously. Okay. It is almost like having your double out there. And there is a scene where uh, Castor Pollux uh, offers paternal advice to uh, Sean Archer's daughter, how to save herself, gives her, gives her, a, knife. Gives her a knife from a potential mon molester. That is a very interesting scene. Now, uh, Nostalgia, we were talking the idea of nostalgia and how it informs postmodern narratives. So, Cage's transformation into Archer, uh, so Nicholas Cage becomes Sean Archer. Who is Sean Archer? Basically, originally John Travolta. But now, now what, what is, if you have watched Nicholas Cage, he happens to be a very intense actor. Hmm? Very intense and there is hardly a funny bone in him. On the other hand, John Travolta is hardly the hyper masculine guy, he is forced to act out. So, he is not, he is the eternal cool, I mean you watch him in Pulp Fiction, yeah. he is what we call a typical cool dude, that is the kind of actor John Travolta is and there is always certain kind of an ambiguity about him. He is not that in your face macho hyper masculine actor at all, whereas Nicolas Cage is. And we have seen him performing very intense, very dramatic roles, roles which John Travolta will never be known for, not no intensity or uh, and no uh, dramatic intensity for John Travolta. But then, uh, when John Travolta assumes the identity of Nicolas Cage, we are taken back to Conair. Yeah, the hero in distress, moonstruck, a romantic hero, hmm? the intense hero, the suffering, the complex hero. Okay. All these attributes you can never associate with John Travolta. John Travolta, when he turns, uh, Nicolas Cage, when he turns into John Travolta. Now, John Travolta is known for certain things. And one is his coolness, okay, and that comes through. And suddenly we find now Nicholas Cage acting the way, because in our, at the back of your mind you know this is Nicholas Cage. He is just wearing John Travolta's face, but then he assumes Travolta's identity, right? And then you see him doing the same, the same walk, the same talk, okay, that Travolta is so loved for. And we know, it evokes the memories of Pulp Fiction, we have just seen him in Pulp Fiction, we remember him for Grease and Saturday Night Fever, 
we know that he John Travolta is the ultimate in Aubert Cool and that is the persona that comes across. So, trademark styles of performance. Having talked about uh, this film, we will we'll talk up, we will refer to another movie which came a little before uh, face off Natural Born Killers, Oliver Stones, and then we will see how this movie satisfies many postmodernist conditions. So, what is it about? It is about uh, uh, again Bonnie and Clyde story redone, serial killers on the run as played by Juliet Lewis and Woody Harrelson. The basic theme is how crimes and criminals are treated in a media saturated society. Uh, how many of you have watched the movie? Very nice. Do you remember the scene where Woody Harrelson first sets his sight upon Juliet Lewis? He brings yeah, there is a very strange scene, he, he is literally carrying a, some dead meat with the blood is still pouring all over the place. Yeah, uh, but how is the scene treated? The, we are told that uh, this girl who is barely out of her teens, Juliet Lewis, she is sexually abused by her father frequently. Yeah, her mother is indifferent to it and there is a brother, a very boorish younger brother who is again uh, absolutely, who is totally into materialistic things of life. All he is interested in, in is how much pocket money he can get out of his parents. Father dominates the household, rules everyone with an iron hand and, and it is a very dysfunctional, miserable household and in walks Woody Harrelson, who is as far removed uh, from a knight in shining armor as could be. He is nothing like that. But for Juliet Lewis character, he is, okay, because her family life is so disturbed that this deranged man could well be her savior. That is the idea. So, we live in a media saturated society where we are conditioned that uh, you know love at first sight can, is possible, where women feel that you know a man just walks in and he can, she can ride away into the moonlight with him. And then uh, suddenly the scene turns into something else. Do you remember what happens? It turns into a, uh, uh, Oliver, uh, Oliver Stone gives it a touch of a television soap opera and a sitcom. Why does he do that? We live in a media saturated society. You fall in love and suddenly everything looks like as if you are part of television and how much do they enjoy being on camera. Remember, later on there is even a character superbly played by Robert Downey Jr., okay, the television anchor. So, a word about Oliver Stone, he comes on the heels of the new Hollywood cinema. He has learned his craft from all those people that we have been talking about so far. Martin is called, he is a successor to them, a very natural successor to Martin Scorsese, to Brian De Palma, to Francis Coppola, Woody Allen. And if you watch him, you can see the influences, all the influences are all there. He's all, he also wrote the screenplay for Scarface, directed by Brian De Palma. He actually served as a soldier in the Vietnam War and therefore, his uh, Vietnam trilogy, Platoon, Born on the 4th of July with Tom Cruise and Heaven and Earth. He has a strong political uh, ideologies. If you watch his list of movies, it is absolutely phenomenal, astounding the way he treats politics. I am, you are talking about a man who has made JFK, who has made Nixon and also W, George W. Bush. Okay. So, a man who is strongly given to uh, understanding the political happenings in the United States. Some of his more entertaining movies, Wall Street, which won Michael Douglas, his uh, Oscar, Any Given Sunday is a wonderful 
drama starring Al Pacino and Cameron Diaz. Even his, one of his earlier films, Salvador, starring James Woods as a reporter, a very young J James Woods. So, um, and uh, it takes place in uh, South America. Yeah. It's a brilliant movie if you watch it. One of his earlier attempts at direction, but so wonderfully done. Do you know the actor who played W? Josh Brolin. Okay. And how closely he resembles. Now, the two major differences between Pulp Fiction and Natural Born Killer. Natural Born Killers, although which, uh, high, it is saturated with violence, it is anti-violence. Whereas, Pulp Fiction tells us violence is cool. Pulp Fiction, of course, a, a typical Tarantino movie, so lot of hip music, rock and surf kind of music, whereas Natural Born Killers has a more, the music of that movie has a more dark tones to it. Uh, while Tarantino experiments with the narrative in Pulp Fiction, Oliver Stone is more interested in editing in Natural Born Killers. So, he does not experiment with as much uh, with the narrative, he does not disturb that. But editing wise, suddenly you find a jump cut at some place, uh, split screen some place else. Uh, the screen suddenly turning black and white from color and from color to black and white, the you know, bat of an eyelid. Okay. So, a lot of experimentation with editing. Tarantino takes uh, in the sense that if you watch, uh, uh, I, I was particularly interested in reservoir dogs. Now, if you look at the dogs, those guys sitting around the table hmm, and the kind of conversation they indulge in, it is extremely hyper masculine and the kind of violence, the ear splicing scene, you know, yeah, it is a total lift from cinema of Sam Peckinpah, where violence is supposed to be extremely cool and very matter of fact. And do you know, there were women in, when the movie was first premiered, women in the audience fainted when they first watched the movie. But there was one woman who really enjoyed it and that woman was Madonna. She said, I like this kind of cinema okay? and I think violence is cool. Yeah. And Tarantino, I mean, no prizes for guessing, he was extremely flattered. I mean. Madonna complimenting you on your very first uh, directorial effort. So, again we were talking about Frederick Jameson and uh, schizo idea of schizophrenia in postmodernist society. So, this is something that you find in natural born killers also. See, all the kind of expressionistic scenes that you find, the distorted images and natural born killers abounds in these images, distorted images, saturated colors. That is not the way it really is. I mean, I will uh, ask you to go back to your taxi driver, where uh, New York is uh, noxious, poisonous, poisonous green gases emanating from all over the place. It is almost like uh, Travis Bickle is riding through Hades, you know, uh, the New York is hell. So, that is what we find in uh, natural born killers also, psychic fragmentation, distorted images. There is a scene where they are poisoned, where the girl is poisoned and the man is so uh, drug induced, he is unable to look for the right medic medicine for her and the entire screen goes green. You remember, for no reason at all, they uh, kill off a very innocent Indian. Native American okay, and then uh, the girl is bitten by a deadly cobra and then they are, uh, they go out hunting for the medicine for her. So, this is what natural born killers is all about if you talk about how postmodernist it is. The movie is extremely rich in past -ish. There is a scene where they have kidnapped a girl from um, from a small town and uh, she is tied up in the same room uh, which this couple lives in 
and while the girl is being tortured, meaningless torture, the couple is watching Scarface. It's very self-referential. Scarface, which was known for its hyperviolence on screen, and more importantly, it's written by Oliver Stone himself. Oliver Stone commenting on his own work that look, we live in a society which is so full of violence. So, if you have uh, lots of experimentation with editing techniques. So, you we get film footage, we get television style of editing. Sometimes the characters speak like cartoons. Mix of music is a mix of mu music too is a pastiche, a mix of contemporary rock as well as very traditional romantic kind of music. And why does he do that? Again, we go back to our uh, new Hollywood filmmakers. Uh, after all, that's, that has been his training ground. Uh, at no stage of the movie, uh, Oliver Stone makes any attempt to, uh, to get you involved, at least emotionally, with what is happening on screen. He, he wants you to keep your distance and therefore, all these fragmented editing techniques. Okay. Again, you are watching a movie about violence, that message comes across. He is not inviting you to get emotionally involved with the audience and therefore, that uh, 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 you know those, those that kind of editing technique. Okay, when you in, don't want to involve the audience, you don't call attention to uh, uh, the narrative and to the editing pattern. Okay, that means you almost feel like one, but suddenly when the, the when the screen goes black and white from color and the other way around, you know oh so yes yeah, so you you know your attention is broken off. When you are watching a movie, something very serious like a, a father abusing his daughter on screen and suddenly the entire scene turns into a television sitcom, you know that you are watching something and you, the director is asking you to think about it. Okay. Do not just get involved in the narrative flow of the movie, that is what he is saying. Was the same book. Tarantino actually commented on Pulp Fiction in the same way. Yeah. Why he actually cuts so that hmm. he can ensure that people are involved, they will be thinking and. Uh, yeah, that's what involved in the sense you are intellectually involved. We don't want such films do not invite people to get emotionally involved. Emotional involvement was a feature of the classic Hollywood kind of cinema. Even for us, it's, cla it's more like, you know, when we watch a movie uh, which is very traditionally structured okay, or a story which is very classically told, then the director is uh, okay, a movie like this invites you to be emotionally involved, because that is the kind of director Yash Chopra is. He wants his own. Therefore, you know there will always be a difference between this set of directors and the other set of directors. More successful directors would always want to capitalize you capitalize on your emotional connect. Okay. Whereas, uh, the other set of directors do not want you to get so emotionally connected with the product, because they want you to think about yeah, the, what is happening on screen. A product of new Hollywood cinema, Oliver Stone's movies are basically extremely anti-authoritarian and this is a trait you find in natural born killers as well. So, all those people who are supposed to uphold our society, parents, sheriffs, cops, uh, media reporters, they are generally portrayed as corrupt, violent, exploitative. Did you find that? Yes. So, there is a statement um, in the movie, which fits the central idea of the film very well. In contemporary America, reality exists only in the context of media images. You remember simulacra and simulacrum, Baudrillard, 
the Gulf War did not take place. So, whatever you watch on media, that is the only truth. Okay. So, you and that is the idea in Wag the Dog as well. There is no war, but a producer has shot a war. Okay, therefore, there is a war and you are supposed to accept it, because I am showing it to you okay. and it is there. So, um, postmodernist cinema and uh, uh, there is an entire list of cinema, which is focused on relationship between films and other media, films and television, films about films. So, general characteristics of this kind of self-referential, self-conscious cinema is that basically these films tend to offer a critique of the commodification of American culture. They map the decline in the ability of Americans to distinguish between fiction and reality, it is very important. And if you look at our society, what is happening around us, I mean look at all these reality shows. You know, this is a uh, comparatively a new phenomenon for us, but do not you feel that uh, increasingly we as a society, we are failing to distinguish between reality and fiction as seen through media images. The bottom line is that everything has been reduced to entertainment. And there is no fixed, ordered and central reality. That is the basic tenet of postmodernist literature. So, watch these two movies again, Natural Born Killers, Pulp Fiction and also Wag the Dog and you will understand. Some other examples, Sidney Lumet's Network, classic movie and uh, um, there is a classic line in the movie, there is no America, there is no democracy. <laughs> what do we have? IBM, Union Carbide, Dow and DuPont. It is a wonderful critique of American capitalism and media. From the director of 12 Angry Men and Dog Day Afternoon. More example where uh, self-conscious cinema tells us that media is taking dangerous proportions. David Cronenberg, the Canadian filmmaker's Videodrome and Alaya Kazan's A Face in the Crowd. Media is addictive as well as corrupt. So, so Robert Redford's Quiz Show, Requiem for a Dream. All these movies, I am very sure are familiar to you. You just have to refresh and apply the theory here. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, directed by George Clooney and then watch Scorsese's uh, very honorable flop, King of Comedy, which almost wiped him off. After New York, New York, he came up with King of Comedy, again with De Niro. In between there was another flop, but at least an Oscar worthy flop, Raging Bull. Raging Bull, let me tell you, was a big flop, commercially flop, when it was first released. Uh, after these flops, what did he make? Three flops in a row, King of Comedy, Raging Bull, New York, New York, out of which Raging Bull at least was a, com a critical success. Last exactly, Last Christ. Temptation of Christ, which was commercially successful. And Martin Scorsese, if you read his uh, biographies and autobiography, the, uh, there is a book called Scorsese on Scorsese, mm, wonderfully written book, where he tells you that people used to laugh in his face after these three movies, but then King of Comedy is a very good critique of media. Nicole Kidman's To Die For, we have already referred to and before we wind up today's class, I want to talk to you about our own attempts at postmodernist cinema which is Anurag Kashyap's Dev D. And if you look at the still here, do you find echoes of face off? Why? Tara, tell me why. And whose faces are joined here and blurring of identities? Abedial and… Uh, Devdas and… Uh, Paro. Paro. Devdas and Paro. 
okay but very psychedelic na okay very count so is this is not your linear traditional devdas but is very post modernist and um, very counter cultural devdas because that the kind of director anurag kashyap is so uh, when he was asked that why devdas okay i am quoting him from one of his interviews um, he said that devdas is very applicable in india because ours is a country known for self pity and that's the kind of hero devdas is who is a hero i mean he is not your eternal loser he is trying to find himself so is coming of age movie and what are you so it's a remake of old devdas plus sex drugs and rock and roll and all these are characteristics of the counter culture cinema so this is another theorist you should look at gerard jenet who proposes the term meta textuality or the critical relation between one text and another whether the commented text is explicitly cited or only silently evoked and you will have plenty of references of this in devdi the commented text is explicitly cited or only silently evoked see if you watch devdi it's not a homage to bimal roy's devdas starring the great dilip kumar or sanjay bhansali's devdas starring the greater shahrukh khan <laughs> okay i can see lot of sniggers here but okay <laughs> that's all right but <laughs> you see so uh, it's not a homage it's actually a hostile reaction towards some of the earlier adaptations ranjit any comments here you have a hostile reaction towards what i just said no the music also in this movie especially yeah completely subverts the kind of music you would expect in devdas I mean, after all, this is not Dev Das Mukherjee, but he is Devendra Dhillo, and therefore he is Devdi. Mm. Okay, so there is the, the text is silently evoked. Now Lenny, as played by Kalki, she is traveling in a coach and watches a video of Bhansali's Dev Das. She watches a scene where Paro and Chandramukhi are dancing together from. Sanjay Leela Bhansali is Devda, so the text is silently evoked. Hmm? Okay, and uh, the in the in 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 the original novel, the two women cross paths just once. They don't dance together, but they just they happen to cross paths. While this one is leaving the town, she is the other is entering the town, which is portrayed in Bimal Roy's version, starring. Vijayanti Mala and Suchitra Sen. There is a scene where uh, in Dev D, Anurag Kashyap's Dev D, the two women do come across face to face. They are uh, in the in the Chandigarh bound train. They are sitting across each other, and they acknowledge each other. Yeah, so it's a it's a very meta textual kind of a scene, and uh, very post modernist in its narrative. There are three parts to it, and you get those cards reading. This is Dev, this is Paro, and this is Chanda. Remember the narrative. If you have missed on that, please do watch the movie again. Okay, and um, there is another very uh, interesting example, and I, again the uh, original or Bhansali's version is evoked when uh, uh, Dev is led by Chunilal to a bar. he passes a poster of shahrukh khan in devdas the 2002 version did you notice that please do watch it and while he is entering this uh, underground bar which is not just a bar but it's also uh, a center for many other ad addictions and outside on the wall you see a poster of shahrukh khan in his devdas avatar okay so uh, dev d's journey from rustic punjab to london and back and also explores the dark morbid underbelly of delhi something which is not usually shown in films delhi is usually the clean cut uh, very sanitized cinema of yash chopra okay beautiful girls 
in beautiful clothes and some heroes in their beautiful cars. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, Punjab or Delhi or Punjabi culture that you are treated to in in a more mainstream cinema, but not here. Okay, so he the film is all about Dev D's journey, literal as well as metaphorical, and see how closely it also satisfies all the conditions given by Joseph Campbell's take away from today's class, you know, read up on Frederick Jameson, Linda Hutchins idea of past dish, uh, Fred, Frederick Jameson's essay uh, on dog day afternoon from signatures of the visible and then hero with a thousand faces by Joseph Campbell, do read it, it is a very interesting take and it, it gives you an insight into many, uh, into the journeys of many of our heroes, well known recognizable heroes. Okay? So, Devdas, the romantic Devdas of, uh, De, uh, of Bansali and uh, Bimal Roy and the postmodern Devdas of Anurag Kashyap. So, while the earlier versions reflect idealism and, uh, but not really social reform, Dev D is more indicative of the globalized Indian youth. So, you have Dev D for the postmodernist globalized times. So, the a reading of Dev D, which I highly, highly recommend, is a pastish, yes. I mean, even music is a pastish. Emotional Atyachar, hmm? Contemporary Rock, Classical Indian Ragas, everything is there, is self-reflexive and highly self-referential in tones and satisfies Bhaktin's idea of heteroglossic narrative, carnivalesque narrative, offering multiple perspectives on an event. There are certain events which are repeated, if you watch it carefully. So, you do not have that fixed order narrative, but it is a very disrupted kind of a narrative. Thank you very much.